transportation to and from the resort. But on snow, it's actually been really good. Good, good to hear, Joe. Thanks, thanks for that. Much, much appreciated. Much appreciated. And uh, hope you enjoyed the session. Um, all right, guys. We, we'll we'll kick off now. It's coming up for coming up for um, five past one. So we'll we'll get started. There's people slowly coming in, and I'll start adding them in. Um, as you've possibly seen on the the email and um, on social media, we've got we've got three little presentations we're going to do today. Uh, one's going to be from Ian. Um, who's going to talk about backcountry and some off-piece skiing. And um, he's put a little presentation together, so we'll get to um, Ian in a moment. Mark's going to do a chat on um, carving. Um, and then later on, he's going to introduce something to do with the instructor qualifications, which we'll talk about later on. And then I've been asked to go through the, the progression from snowplow turns to basic parallel turns with regards to movements. And I'll put a short presentation together for that as well. So... Um, just to give you all a, a little bit of an update, I don't know if, if many of you have been keeping track on the news, I'm sure most of you would have done, um, but the news in the, the UK today, they're saying that there's, there's likely to be um, a vaccine passports coming into play uh, for people that want to travel, want to get out to um, summer resorts and, and winter resorts. Um, there was discussion about that on the on news today. Um, so there's lots of changes currently happening. Um, the government warned yesterday um, ag against trying to book currently summer holidays at the moment. Um, so travel at the moment, obviously, to get us from the UK or from around the world to move to different countries is looking quite tricky. So, you know, we'll, we'll keep, keep an eye on what's going on and we'll, we'll see how we go with that. Um, but we're, we're going to still currently try to plan and put things in place for the summer and the winter, whether it be just in the UK or into, into Europe itself. But um, it, it might change on a weekly, monthly basis, but we'll just, we'll just keep everyone updated and uh, see how we all go. If anyone does get any um, uh, information or something they want to share with a group or share with us, we can put it out onto email or on social media. So just feel free to um, get any inside knowledge, get, get that to us and we can put it out there. That'd be great. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. I, felt, I, can't, I think it might have been Jez um, that sent me a link to um, a guy called Tom Gelly, uh, who's um, um, an instructor in Australia. And he's released a few movies with regards to ski fitness and biomechanics and, and movements. And what I'll do is after today's session is I'll, I'll put a link onto um, Tom Gelly's um, website and the information that was sent to me. I, th I think it was Jez that sent it across. And um, I'll, uh, for those that want to get into a bit of fitness, he's a, he's a nice guy, quite simple, quite straightforward. Uh, feel free to have a look at the, the fitness stuff that we mentioned a little bit of it last week. And then um, uh, I, I might send Tom uh, an email and just see if we could potentially get Tom on this Zoom chat at some point talking about biomechanics or uh, fitness in general. I've bumped into him twice at the last couple of world um, Interski Congress in Argentina and Bulgaria. So he might be willing to join in. I'll, I'll send him a message and see if we can get some fitness and biomechanic tips. So um, just to try and inspire us all and keep us all going um, a little bit mad rather than just sitting on these couches and just relaxing too much. Um, what, what we'll do, everyone, is when we go on to the, the presentations, I'm going to mute everyone. Um, or you can mute yourself, and then what I'll do is I'll get Mark and Ian when they present theirs, and myself will we'll unmute ourselves so you can hear us. But if there is any problem, just stick your thumb up or send us a message on the chat, and uh, we can go from there. So um, I'll uh, go to the mute all button, and Ian, if you're ready to do your little session, we'll um, uh, we'll go from there. Ali, you need to enable me to share yep. my screen. Okay, yeah, I'll do that. I can hear you now. Uh, okay, so that works for you? Aha, voila, desktop. Excellent. No, oh, now it's asking me to, oh, what's going on here, desktop. Bear with me.
probably hmm. should have uh, sorted this out in those 10 minutes we had before we opened things up, shouldn't we? <laughs> well, rather than just chatting rubbish, we, we should have done really, so. That's... Yeah, I've got, I've got you on. Talk, yeah, talk about, talk amongst yourselves. It's asking me to look at system preferences for some reason. Well, should we, should we do marks first and then we'll come back to you, Ian? Yeah, it's, let me look into it. Okay. Sorry about that, folks. All right. Mark, are you, you good to go? Uh, as ready as I'll ever be. All right, here we go. Uh, let me just see if I can bring this up. So Ali said that I was going to do something about carving. I'm not. I'm going to do something about carve. The uh, the technology um, product thing in the jiggy. Does that, is that there for everyone? Okay, it is. Everyone see that website? Give me a thumbs up. Those are perfect. Lovely. Um, so last week, someone mentioned, uh, someone just asked in the chat, does anyone have any experience with carve? Uh, any knowledge about it? Um, so let me start this off by saying I don't. I haven't used it, um, so I don't have any personal direct knowledge of it, but I thought it, it was worth taking a look at because I would consider myself um, an interested customer, for one thing, and, um, but also a little bit uh, skeptical in some ways as well. So I figured for anyone that is interested in this stuff, why don't we take a look at it together and, you know, as a, from a customer standpoint of view and see if it's something that we would actually use, could make use of, or, or, or whether it's a gimmick. Um, so the first thing that it's probably worth noting about Carve is what is it, first of all? Um, the short version of this is it's, it's a feedback tool. It's providing you information. That's it. It's nothing more. It's nothing less than that. It's, it's just a form. It's just a type of feedback. Technically, you could probably say it's not feedback that you couldn't get through any other means. It just the way it provides to you is very definitive, right? It's a number in front of you. It's it's a visual thing. It's very it's very cut and dry. Um, and I and I think the bonus of that is is it's is it's what's actually happening versus what you think might be happening. That's probably the key thing. We'll come back to that probably later on. So there's a couple of key components to it. There's the equipment. There's the, you know, the actual physical thing that it is and the information that it provides. And then there's the app and the service and, and how it translates that information. So there you go. This is, so this is the website. This is the carve and video and stuff going on here. If we just kind of scroll through down it, this is just all the marketing stuff right here on, on the initial little bit. But that's, that's your, um, your actual physical thing. So it's basically this footbed and then the battery pack that goes on the side of the boot. I don't know if there's, if there's some of the other sensors in that battery pack too, um, but that's the equipment. Um, I believe it says somewhere on here that it's about three millimeters uh, thick. So it's not particularly thick, depending on the ski boot you have. I Personally, that's actually a concern of mine, whether or not I actually have three millimeters worth of room to go in my ski boot. And I'm not actually sure I do. Um, but anyway, so unlock your next level. So it's, it's kind of drilling that this thing can be a pocket instructor, as it were. Uh, personalized to your technique. Um, so it's just kind of giving us some of the information. So balance, good. It's a pressure sensitive thing. Edging. So it can tell, the things that it can tell, it can tell where you're applying pressure. There's a bunch of pressure sensors on it. Uh, there's an accelerometer and a gyrometer, I think, on it as well. So it can actually tell your edge angle as well, uh, your, your pressure inside and outside ski. And then you go just a few more things here. So this is all the information that's providing you and, and how it's providing it to you, right? This is like the raw, the raw data. And it's decided that up here in this area is, is that's, that's good. That's where you want to be. Same thing there and same thing there. And then it kind of puts it all together into your ski IQ. So all of the information and stuff that it puts together, it's got this overall score that you can then compete in the lead. Was it's this is what I like about this technology? It's kind of gamifying uh, skiing, which I think is a good thing. I think it's a fun thing. It might help keep people uh, involved in the sport a little bit more. Uh, a little bit of setup. There's a couple of things here in, in the feedback that people have written that I kind of wanted to um, uh, to just read quickly yeah, because some of it you have to take with a bit of a pinch of salt um, and I'm not going to spend forever talking about this stuff. Uh, I'm not going to find it now, am I? Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, so this person here, so three-time Olympian alpine skier, uh, I can't, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that name, I'll butcher it. 
but it's not just what you can see film or even how the athlete feels you know all of those things being types of feedback right with carve you actually know what's happening so it takes other types of feedback and it's putting a number to it it's, it's telling you definitively one way or another and you may or may not like that it i, I think there's a chance to that you could get the nice surprise that maybe Carve tells you you're a better skier than you think you are, but you've also got to be equally prepared for the slap in the face that you're not as good a skier as you think you are, according to Carve too. So, you know, you, you have to be open to this thing because like we discussed last week, you know, it's just information. Uh, Jonathan below on the P PSI, so I think it did exactly what it said, said it would do. It has the potential of really educating people on what great skiing is. I, and I think that's a really valid line too, because it is providing information. So it's educating you there. Uh, how it works. Your invisible instructor. I keep hammering that one in, hey? Uh, da, 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 da. So that's kind of how it all goes into it. So here you go. So 72 pressure sensors. I need to move my camera around here. Uh, nine axis motion, accelerometer, gyroscope, magnetometer. Couldn't really tell you what. A magnetometer does maybe someone else can inform me uh, of that better um uh, better but this is kind of what it is so yeah three three millimeters thick or less than three millimeters thick so not a huge amount um like i said for my ski boot i'm in an rd last so that's like the the, the minimal amount of room you could possibly have inside a ski boot so and i have put stuff inside there before so i know that is a challenge to fit something else in there Batteries that will outlast, outlast your legs. It's nice to know. Built to fall. So this is all, all kind of stuff that you, you want to know. So this is, this is the bits that I want to know, right? So now we're getting into the app and the service, right? Because it's basically what the app is doing is it's the information, the raw information this thing provides, it's now presenting it to you. But the second thing it's going to do is it's going to translate that information too into some kind, kind of instruction, i.e. get further forwards or get better balance on your outside ski at a guess i don't i don't know exactly what it says um but if i kind of go through this this is kind of what i'm left thinking when i look at all this information i'm not going to take you all, all, all through it. you guys can also have a look at this yourself but for me i would kind of be using this and looking at it and thinking well i just want the information the information would be good to have I don't know how much I'm going to make use of the app telling me how to adjust. Uh, and I'm not sure I'd make much use of the app giving me exercises and things to do either. Um, maybe that, maybe that would for you. And the kind of reason for that is, while I think this app will get better over time, I, I, I've kind of spoken to a few people. So I had a level four out in Canada kind of messaged me about this and he's someone that, that is working with Carve and provides some feedback and stuff like that. And his ski school is actually putting together a carve based lesson product. So students will be on this thing and using this thing, which I find really interesting. And that, that to me is, is how instructors and professionals are going to use this as an additional tool to teach. Um, I think will be, will be really vital. Uh, for me, training people, you know, if I could get this in, in people's ski boots, I think that could be really good too. Um, could you use it on your own? Probably. Uh, but I think the important thing to remember is when you get given this information, it's still on you incumbent as the learner to do something with that information. You know, if it says your edge angle is 20 degrees and you want it to be 80 degrees, there's a good chance that the, the feedback that this app is able to provide and the exercise that it provides might help you to, to achieve that, give you some direction, but it's still on you to go and do that. You still have to take the information uh, and go and do that. And obviously it's, I can't imagine yet, and I'd love to be proven wrong, I can't imagine it's smart enough to tell you that, you know, this is the amount of edge angle you have, this is what you need to do to, to, to achieve that in terms of if something else is off, is it smart enough to say, well, that's off, so it's not allowing you to achieve this? I, I don't know. Um, but that's, I'm trying to find out more about that and the actual app. I should be getting sent some screenshots and things like that. And I have actually sent Carve a, a, an email to get on to, um, to potentially get into their program and, and get the product. So hopefully I can learn more uh, myself. Um, I'll open it up afterwards if anyone else has, has any more info. But there's a few kind of other things that I think is worth knowing. Will it fit in? Uh, is it for me? I'm an advanced skier. Um, this little bit here where it's kind of talking about basically if you've plateaued, I kind of translate that as well. You might think you're an advanced skier, but you know, 
our product can help you be be better. Maybe you have just stayed at the same level. You know, it's, it's that element of, well, we can actually show you and how you can be better. Um, and this bit here, this is probably the, the key thing that might put some people off. Carve is not optimized for off-piece skiing. It's, it's, for, it's for groomed skiing, right? It's for groomed performance. Uh, or as the other bit, of, I know there is like a audio feedback that it can give you as well. Um, if you don't like headphones or audio stuff being played into your head, then you're not going to want to use that feature as well. So that's, that's Carve, right? And you can see it's basically the information it provides is based around balance, pressure, edging, and rotation. And it's doing it all from the ground up. So it's doing it from a sensor that it puts underneath your foot. I kind of wanted to bring up, this is another company. This is really new. Um, I don't even know if the app yet has been able to connect to these devices. It says it's happening in February this month. So I don't know if that's actually happened yet or not. But see, these things are called snow cookies. And what these things do is two of them go on your skis. Uh, this is the information provides, but I'm gonna just want to see if I can kind of find a picture of it attached. So yeah, two of them go on your skis. There's one there, one there, and then one of them goes on the chest up there. So it's measuring the information a little bit differently. It gives you a lot of the same information, but it also gives you things like G-force in a turn. You're not just getting your speed and stuff like that. Um, but it can't necessarily tell you exactly where your balance is for after long your foot, which Carve does. So pros and cons to, to both. Um, this one comes in at about $449 and Carve comes in at... Um, at about uh, 350 pounds. So somewhat comparable in terms of price. My issue with this one, you know, Carve goes in any ski boot, just take it out and stick it in a new ski boot, snow cookie here. Um, you need to buy more attachments to go on your skis. So it's a proprietary mount too. So that's anytime you wanna take these things off and stick it on another ski, that's costing you money in additional. So, you know, pros and cons to both, but they're, they're both trying to do the same thing. A um, friend of mine sent me this as well, motion capture on your phone. The Hungarians did this at the last Interski. Um, and it's these, these devices that you attach and you get this um, actual like motion capture image of, of your skiing. I don't know what the benefit of this is more than um, just watching video of yourself skiing right now, but it's interesting, right? In terms of how people are coming out with technology. But this is, this is kind of based on what this company is, is looking at is you get this stuff, but you're also going to design an app uh, to, to work how you want it to work. So no one's designed an app for this specifically for skiing yet. You would just have this image, this three-dimensional image of, of someone skiing. And I was going to see if I could find that, but... Uh, yeah. I, I'll, I'll let people kind of look at this. So this one here is wherenotch.com. Uh, this one is Snow Cookie. I believe Bodie Miller had a hand in this one. I could be wrong on that one. Don't quote me on that. But just to give you a little bit of an idea on how I might think about using Carve, um, this is actually a video Tom Gelly recently did uh, with Carve, completely uh, unattached to me bringing up Tom Gelly with Ali bringing up Tom Gelly earlier. Um, but he, I'm just going to kind of show you the bit where he takes what he did on skis and he then overlaid some video of it to the information that some of the raw information that Carve gave him. I'll play the video. So I'm gonna have a look at the video and under the hood here to see what I'm talking about in real time with the pressure sensors of the uh, Carve insole. So I was saying through the end of the turn, right through here, I wanna be more on the tail or heel of the ski and we'll go a little further down here. Bang, red dots showing up. So I've definitely moved my pressure. There's the fall line coming out of it, it's moved aft, and you can see the ski tail stops displacing. Displacing here to help me steer, stops displacing and actually cuts and shoots across the hill. So taking a look at the run where I deliberately stayed forward at the end of the turn, and what you'll see is the tails continue to displace and wash out at the end of the turn there. So even though I've got lots of edge angle, like it looks like my knees tipped over, my tail is washing out, there's no grip, and the carve insole gives me the pure data of why that's happened. And it's because my weight is too far forward. And it's also interesting to notice that I have to use a lot of heel pressure on my inside ski to try and not fall over. So uh, I kind of, you know, leave that there. I just, so I kind of watched this video and I'm left thinking, um, 
uh, one, how is this put together? Is this all in the Carve app? Or is this something he's had to work to put together? Is he had to take this foot bit from Carve and then this video and overlay it? I See, that, that to me is an interesting thing. Like, how usable is this? But for me, this information from Carve becomes way more usable when synced up to the video run of him skiing. So you've already got video feedback and now you're just adding to that. But it, it gives you great information, right? Like that right there, that pressure on his inside heel as a result of staying forwards on his outside ski, that's interesting to know, right? Like that might not actually be something you ever notice or were aware of without that information. So kind of interesting. Um, so with that all said, I, I, I don't know if I find myself in any kind of different position. I'm still an interested customer. I'd be interested to try it myself and put it to the test and see what it can and can't do. Um, I think the hardware and the information it provides is really good. And where Carver ahead of the game is basically their app and the service it provides. So how it's taking that information and translating it and making it usable for you. Um, but like I said, it's still on you to take that information and, and figure out how to make adjustments. You still need to go out and make the movements and make the adjustments. This just gives you a direct line of feedback. Um, with that said, if anyone else is in the chat here and has any experience with this, this and would like to kind of maybe answer a couple of questions as to how useful that app is with regards to how it, how it directs you and, and how it translates that information for you. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear it. If not, I will provide updates as I hear more about it from the people that I know that are using it. I fitted some of these into ski boots at Snow and Rock. And my, my reservation about it is not the technology, but it's, some, it's quite an expensive item for something that's, I'm not convinced how long those footbeds will last. Um, they're quite flimsy when you put them in. Well, it does, um, it, it should go either underneath your footbed in the liner, mm. I'm assuming is where it goes. So you, you'll have something on top of it. So I don't, I don't see it taking a huge amount of wear and tear. And with a footbed on top and the baseboard of the boot underneath, it, should, it shouldn't be bending and flexing that much. But you, you know what, it's a valid point. I take my liner out. My, my liner is a lace-up liner, so it stays attached to my foot, which means it's coming out every time. And there is bending there. I had a friend whose uh, heated boots that went, uh, the heating element that went into the liner, he had that fit in and it broke. Uh, fairly quickly because of uh, you know taking his foot in and out with the liner attached in an RD boot. So yeah, valid point. I hadn't even thought about that. Um, another question to ask someone that's used them. Yeah. Um, when you put it in the boot, uh, Mark, it has a, a sticky tab. Okay, and um, they're very very delicate, so you can break them. They're quite. They're quite, they're not pliable. So when you put them in the boot they're and you put them right in the bottom solid. of the boot and your liner and everything goes on top and they stay in the boot permanent. Um, we bought them a couple of years ago, but our skiing the level hell? was <laughs> nowhere near the level to use carve. So we haven't actually used it. Uh, the other disadvantage with them is that uh, they found when they first started using them, the battery attached to the back of your boot so when you were when you were taken out by a boarder or another skier, the batteries, uh, the cable was getting get the cable was getting cut. So that's why in the new videos you see the battery on the yeah. side. The other thing was it would only work on an Apple yeah. um, uh, phone, iPhone. Uh, they now recently in about the last eight or nine months, they've uh, you can do it on an Android now. So they've developed their software so that you can use it on Android. They've got a, an app for that. The other thing is it works with GPS. So you can get your speed and everything and you, rec you can record everything and then sit in your hotel room and then analyze your run or whatever afterwards or do real time, as you said. But the disadvantage with it is it does not work indoor, in indoor uh, ski centers. Camel, no. It does not work indoors <laughs> at all. Right. Oh, really? Is that so? It relies so it's on, on that GPS. So it's only GPS. It relies on GPS to work. Yeah. So huh. it does connect with your phone, and you can get real time information, but it only works when it's sending a signal up to the satellite. That is. It does not work indoors in Hemel. 
that is bizarre to me that it needs that. Yeah, we asked them a couple of years ago would they develop that, and they said they were working on They're that working kind on of it. thing for indoor ski centres. Now, whether they've developed that or not, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't looked at the latest um, advert for the product um, in, in the last few months. Yeah, um, I, it, but it I think you're be... quite right. It is information only, uh, information you can use, but it doesn't tell you what's causing you not to put more than 50 or 60 you percent pressure to. on the outside foot or whatever you're doing when you're turning. Um, and it only works on carving. It doesn't necessarily work on other kinds of skiing. It works um, well with an instructor as well. Though. Yeah. If you had an instructor who was looking at you, as you said earlier, it's nice. or maybe you know filming you, you could maybe you could try and marry it up in real time or something. But yeah. Yeah. Well, let, let, let me ask you this, um, and, and you might maybe you're you're not able to answer this if you haven't used it a huge amount. Um, but if you think back to the presentation last week of learning versus performance, right? And because you're saying that it can't really help you with the cause in terms of, well, you've only got this much pressure here. You know, it's not, it doesn't necessarily provide that much help with how to make the adjustment. Is, is that kind of what you mean? Well, it gives you, uh, if you it look at the videos, tips, the, the videos give you a little tip. They develop with it. Most of the development was done with the US ski team. I think uh, they went over to the States and, they had, and they have, they've had other people in the Alps, some of the ex-French um, ski team and Italian ski teams. So they've had high level skiers use it. Um, uh, I mean, Lynn and myself, we're at the level where we're only just starting <laughs> to feel the different parts of our feet and what we're supposed to be doing with our toes or our heels when we're doing turning. We're only getting towards that now. So it's... My view is it's for an advanced skier who wants to, it. you know, perfect that turn or a racer who wants to really know more information. Um, I understand that in, in the four years they've sold 10,000 of them in four years, which probably isn't a lot, but they are expensive for what they're, they're quite expensive, but they give you a lot, quite a lot of information. They don't if take you, up much room in your boot. No, no. You wouldn't even know they were in the boot. No. Oh, well, you, you, you say that, but I, when I tell you I'm in an RD last and I don't have a lot of room in there <laughs> for the up liner. Three I, millimetres. I, yeah, it's three millimetres. Yeah, with, with that three millimetres, I'm going to need additional boot work done on, on the heel. Oh uh, on the heel yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just because I've got a little bit of a, I, if, I'm not going to show you my feet right now, but I've got a nice little heel <laughs> spur over there. Well, we, and, uh, we, um, yeah. and, the, and there's, and they come in different sizes so that you can get a near, the nearest size to your boot that you can. There's several different sizes. And you have you to can, cut it. Yeah. And, and you, oh, you can you trim it. You can trim yeah, it. Yeah, it, it comes, it, it's a bit, it's a little bit bigger. And then you trim and there's a blue line. Obviously don't trim, you don't trim it below the blue into line. The blue. Otherwise you're going into the sensors, but you trim it um, to the side. You put your foot on it mark around your foot and then trim it to the size. Sorry about that everyone. Did, uh, did everyone get kicked out of there? Alistair? Yes? It's Norman Gill. Hi you Norman. Hi. Uh, Sorry going about to, Going back to what we were talking about, I, I just thought to myself, uh, there's been no, in carve, there's been no mention of the state of the equipment or the fitting of the boots or the ever-changing terrain or have I just got it wrong? Mark, do you want to answer that? Wait, 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 wait. Can you ask again? What, what exactly uh, do you mean there with regards to what, 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 what are you after? On carve. It's talking yeah. about what the skier is, the movements of the skier. It has not alluded to the state of the equipment that they've got got on uh, the, if the boots are fastened properly and the ever changing terrain sometimes it's the terrain that creates pressure and not yourself and it's you that has to control that but this uh, carve has not mentioned that or have I got it wrong no, I, I, I think you're, I think you're on the right ballpark of, of you're already ident identifying some limitations to the technology, right? Um, I would imagine that's probably why it needs to be connected to the phone. Um, so it, it yeah, it, it's probably not going to be able to, 
and it's okay so take moguls it's not designed to work in moguls because it just can't handle i would imagine right now that change in pressure as you roll over a bump um I, I I couldn't tell you how it handles just terrain going from steep to flatter to steeper. I, I don't know. Um, that's actually probably where that, that device Snow Cookie uh, actually would do that. I If you look closer on that website, it actually um, can show you every single turn that you made on the way down the slope. Um, I, I mean... I don't know if that's worth bringing up. I, I won't bother bringing that up. But yeah, I, I think what you're doing there is just identifying some limitations of it now, because it, it's just underneath your foot. It doesn't know if your boot's undone or not done up. It also doesn't know how you're moving above it in order to create the pressure where you are creating it, which I think is why, it's, why it struggles to then translate it on how you should adjust, because it doesn't know what you're doing above the, above the baseboard in the, in the first place. Um, and I think that's where... As, as has been said, that's why I think being used as an additional training tool in conjunction with another instructor, then you can then you could start to understand not just only the information in front of you, but how when you made adjustments, when you tried different things, what was the impact it had with the information. Absolutely. So that, that's where I see it working hand in hand. Like I said, my, my friend in Canada that's looking to put a carve-based <laughs> teaching product together within their ski school, I've told them I'm interested in that and I'd love to hear more about that and how they've actually used this because this is this is no different than an instructor taking video of a student coming down and then using that as feedback. If that video, if you haven't put the groundwork in before you take that video in terms of this is our goal, this is what it should look like, you know, these are some of the results and outcomes of it. When you watch that video, it's, 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 it's useless. Um, and I'm going a little bit off topic here, but that, that's because this opens the door for a future conversation. How many people here have done, and I'm using quotation marks here, video feedback, where you go out on slope, you take video, and then at the end of the day, you go inside and you watch that video while you're all having a few beers and you sit around, and then the instructor that took the video tells you what's going on in the video. Hands up if that's a video feedback experience. I'm going to tell you this. This this is um, this is a spicy one. This is a hot take for you right now. That is not video being used as feedback. That's the instructor giving you feedback with the video as a visual tool to show you what they saw. That's not video feedback. Feedback needs to have information as it's as it's used. Okay, as you're doing something, and that feedback, that information needs to direct the adjustments. If you watch video and you don't get any information from it, you don't know what's going on in that video, it, it, it wasn't set up well. If you can watch, if you can look at a video and know exactly what happened versus what you wanted to happen, then, you've, then the, that video contained relevant information that allowed you to go and do something afterwards. And that's what feedback needs to do. But that's, and that's, uh, I kind of bring that up because it's the same thing with Carve. If you don't have some context, to that information before you go and use it. When you look at that information, it's, it's pretty much useless with regards to what you're gonna do with it afterwards. And it's also pretty much useless if you can't go back on snow straight away and try and do something about it, make an adjustment, try something different. Um, that's really what feedback needs to do. It needs to direct your next attempt. Does that make sense? It's just going back, you mentioned you mentioned uh, Tom Gelly earlier. If you go on to YouTube and you look at all the Tom Gelly videos, the ones there's some that end in carve. You can see there all the font, and he uses carve a lot in his videos. Uh, and it is it's just a pressure tool. So it tells you where you're pressing your foot. It gives you instant feedback to your headphones, so that as you're doing it, you know um, and and it's got the uh, magnometer, magnometer, which is just measures movement. So it will tell you how much your ski is edging. It will tell you whether you, you're four and a half pressure, uh, and it tells you whether your inside foot is pressured, how much pressure is on your inside foot, how much is on the outside foot. So you'll see, if you watch his videos, it will explain exactly what it does, and then you make your own mind up, okay? 
yeah, I, I, yeah, exactly. Um, I, th this, is, this is how I'm going to wrap up the, the conversation on Carve, is um, really, really interesting uh, information, could be very, very useful, probably a bit gimmicky, and really only may be uh, useful in certain, certain circumstances, but at the end of the day, still dependent on you to do stuff with. Um, if anyone is more interested to, to have a conversation, to, to dive a little bit more into, into feedback and different types of feedback and how to actually use it in future conversations, uh, just let us know in the in the chat, and um, and that's something we can kind of look at a little bit deeper uh, in the future as well. Anyway, that's uh, that's all for me. Unless there's any kind of further points thanks, or questions. Thanks, thanks, Mark. Okay. As, as as Mark's just mentioned, if if you've got any questions on that, or you, you you want to revisit that topic, or we can look at that again, just put put a message into the chat, and we'll record all the the chat messages again, um, and we can then discuss from there. So if you do have anything you want to know or go on a little bit more detail with this, then yeah, stick, stick a message into the mm. chat and we can gather all that information from there. So well, you can tell Joe works in the US with the, uh, with the uh, mention of a possible lawsuit with um, the distraction factor with the, the <laughs> definitely, definitely a US ski teacher there. There we go. Um, so yeah, thank, thanks for your question, Norman. Did, did, that, did that cover a little bit of what, what you were mentioning there? Oh, can't. You're, you're mute. Yes, it was uh, very interesting. It is was Mark's answer. Thanks very much. I just leave you with this subject with one thing: when a, an instructor gives you a photograph, a still photograph, and say, "Look, this is what you're doing now," uh, that is that is just. I laugh so loud. It's just a piece of paper with a skier on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's, there's obviously a lot more information that needs to go with the picture, with the videos, and, and like Mark's mentioning, it, it needs to be defined on what you're trying to do, where you're trying to achieve that. It could be a flat or steep slope. Um, and the, the feedback becomes so, so so relevant as long as the subject is kept to um, uh, um, in quite detail. So, um, cool. Excellent. Uh, where's Ian gone? Where's Ian gone? Oh, sorry, Lynn, is you about to say something? Yeah, I was about to say, when you did the feedback um, on the last one that we had with you, yeah. where you did the feedback over what we were actually doing. Yeah. So, you spoke whilst yeah. you were doing it. It was actually very, very good. And I, yeah, I found feedback. the recorded feedback the extremely useful. Yeah. So, thank you, Alison. Yeah, it's a good way That's of doing thank it. Thank you, Ali. My absolute <laughs> It's why we're paying the big bucks. <laughs> yeah, we're <well, <it's> good. <laughs> the great. Yeah. Uh, after this lockdown, I might have to double them big bucks. <laughs> no, don't do that. No, 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 no. We love I, you. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. Yeah. Um, all right, we're, we're going to go on to Ian. Uh, Ian's, Ian's going to yep. try and get his um, up. Um, just let me just double check. Right, I'm just gonna. Well, I've just clicked you onto multiple share there, Ian. So tell me okay. if you can come up. If not, then I'll. Wow, this looks a bit better. Here we go. Excellent. Okay. Uh, Ali, can you hear me? I can hear you, mate. Yeah, all good. Yeah, cool. Um, I've lost my mute and unmute button. Um, hi folks, uh, some of the faces on there I recognise, uh, so nice to see you. Um, sat in a uh, <coughs> rather dreek, wet uh, Chamonix Valley at the moment, so uh, you can live a little bit uh, vicariously through me and some of the pictures I'll show you today. Um, <coughs> backcountry and off-piste. Um, I'm going to talk broadly about backcountry because that encompasses off-piste. And it's really where Ali and I focused on what we wanted to, or spoke about what we wanted to talk about. And it's, you could speak for days and days and days about skiing of all sorts. And even when you chunk it down into uh, something as specific as off-piste or backcountry, there's still a lot going on. So we've decided to just give a bit of an intro of uh, what it's all about, why people actually bother, 
um, and then a couple of other sessions as the weeks go past that will um, go into a bit more geeky detail, not onerous, but things to consider and so forth from that. So really, why bother? Um, you start at four or five o'clock in the morning. Uh, the picture in the dark there was actually 5 a.m., 6 a.m. on New Year's Day this year. Um, I'm not quite sure how I ended up being dragged up a hill at that time of day on the 1st of January, but it was bloody awesome. <laughs> um, there's a lot of uphill in terms of backcountry rather than lift access off piece. You can be skinning up for two, three hours. The, the central picture there is over in the Araby, so only about 45 minutes away from us. Um, that's about two hours in, I think, and we've still got about another half an hour, 45 minutes to go. And then there's these bloody things called avalanches that can come down on you. So why? Well, it's when you get views like this, um, you spend awesome time with mates, chatting, getting to know other people, small groups. We'll talk about group size a bit later on. But it's kind of like that beer at the end of the day, that one or two runs or three runs you get taste absolutely remarkable. You're out there, you're broadly alone. There's something really, really invigorating about it. Um, you think about some of those greatest runs you've had off the lift, whether it's on, you're the first person down the groomer or you've hopped over the back of somewhere onto an off-piece section. It is fabulous. But there's stuff that you've really got to consider. Um, you just to sort of demystify something that in resort we there's been a term kicking around for a long time of side country so off-piste in resort is not side country off-piste in a resort might as well be back country um, there's no real distinction the snow and avalanches and the dangers that you face when you're not on a groomed patrol piste run are identical the, the mountain doesn't say, oh, it's all right, they're in a resort, we won't have lunch here. And I think this year in particular, with so many of the resorts in France being closed, it's really heightened that awareness of, we say, oh yeah, but I'm skinning up in a, in a resort as well. It's not controlled, it's not controlled anyway. The piece, the duty of care isn't there, then it's not open. So just bear that in mind next time you're, you're skiing through Valais Air and you hop off onto a, what you might describe as side country. It, you are off piece, you are all intents and purposes um, got readily accessed back country. Um, some of the journeys you can have when you go back country are remarkable. It's not always just this brutal slog. Uh, the picture on the left is, for those that you know, Le Contamine, um, the back of uh, sort of Saint Gervais Megev, Haute Luce. Um, you can get the lifts up the top, you're immediately onto this plateau, you can have an awesome day traveling in the back country. You've got a couple of really nice descents to go down to without too much onerous skiing. So back country and touring isn't about always about the, the 5 a.m. starts and slogging for two or three hours uphill. It is a great, great place to be. And um, the, the picture on the, the right-hand side is actually from Pete, Pete Mason. Um, I think that's over in uh, Cormayeur. And often you just don't get these runs in resort. That picture was taken after lunch and that's access from Cormier, but people don't make the effort to do half an hour. That's all it takes to get to that sort of terrain. Um, a pair of skins, a bit of knowledge, a bit of experience, go with someone who's experienced, not necessarily just a ski instructor. They need to know the back country, but the ski instructors uh, that do say, yep, yeah, I'm happy to take people off piece touring, happy days. Um, or hire an IFMGA guide. And here's some uh, more pictures from January this year. It, you just don't get some of these views in resort. You don't get the peace and quiet. So that's a lot of the reasons um, why we bother. And these last two shots of, uh, of uh, runs, um, the one, the picture on the left, that was at three o'clock in the afternoon. You're still getting fresh tracks. Uh, it was absolutely awesome. This was the same day, in fact, these two pictures. Um, we saw five or six other people on the hill. 
that day. Um, we lapped the, the descent a couple of times. All those tracks, the, the four tracks there are, are, are tracks. It was absolutely fantastic. Um, and that's why we bothered getting out there. And the tricky thing that as an avalanche educator, I'm a avalanche pro, uh, Joe, uh, the chap Sam Jackson, that's where I did all my exams a few years ago. Um, I'm 90 odd days into getting my pro two. So it's quite a rigorous program that you go through to, to provide sort of avalanche education and safety. We're always talking about the, the bad stuff, the downside, you've got to be careful. We feel like the sort of bad parents sometimes. But to put it in context, the, the back country or off piste is generally safe. Um, the real, real trick and the importance of going with people that know what they're talking about, have the experience and getting avalanche education or off piece education, it's absolutely critical to not recognize when it isn't. So the snowpack this year has been really, really weird. Um, it's been an exceptionally unusual season. We've had rain at two and a half thousand meters. It's penetrated the entirety of the snowpack. <clears throat> in certain areas, we've had huge, huge slides. You might have seen some of the reports in uh, Verbier and the, the tragedies and people uh, being caught and unfortunately dying in situations. The snowpack evolves all the time. So those same runs that might have slid might be okay at the moment. Now, I'm not advocating skiing in avalanche paths, but it does evolve. So some of the things to bear in mind that is free, easily accessible, it's worth noticing some of these things when you're in resort as well. You'll have seen signs around the um, lift stations, the avalanche symbols uh, at the bottom of the bulletins, what uh, level it is. There's always chat about that in the bars the night before. But the thing is that in Europe, we currently, or pretty much globally, we use a, a scale from low to very high. Um, the UK, I think parts of the States, uh, some of Canada maybe, are dropping the numbers because they're slightly misleading. Because you go, at the moment in Chamonix today, I think the uh, people talk about a three, considerable. It's in the middle. So, oh, it's fine. But the thing is, when you put it into context of in the Chamonix Valley and most resorts, when they're talking about a five, a very high, the mayor of that region is talking about evacuating or considering evacuating the entire valley. The lifts are not open. You are not going in the mountains. So the scale is actually one to four. And when you consider it on a one to four level, where's three considerable? It's above middle. Now, again, I'm not saying do not go skiing on a, on a three day, but it's bearing in mind making different decisions about the terrain that you're going to go into. If snow's the problem, then terrain is always your answer. You go on lower angle terrain, you go on different aspects, things like that. The other things, just as a sort of intro, um, that are common on pretty much all bulletins, uh, there is a nuance in the French bulletins, and I'm, I'm broadly talking about the European bulletins here. Um, those symbols in the top left, they're just a type of risk that's there. So it, if there's fresh snow, you're going to get storm slabs, uh, fresh snow, um, soft slab avalanches, stuff like that. If there's been wind, a persistent weak layer is something that's buried that we're aware of. Uh, this year, we've got a, a couple of potential persistent weak layers, certainly one at the ground interface. Um, more into the spring, but we've had two weeks here of rain, as I said, two and a half thousand. So we are thinking about wet snow. The temperature in the snowpack has been plus degrees. I was out Thursday doing some snow analysis to ground. It was zero degrees at ground. It was plus degrees right above that, one and two degrees. And uh, gliding snow, so new snow or windblown snow that's been deposited on a, an ice crust, something like that. So you'll see those symbols in pretty much all the bulletins. You will not see them at the moment in the French bulletin. What you do see, including in the French bulletin, is that north, south, east, west rows and an elevation split. And that's just where it's shaded black. That's the aspects that you're, they're talking about in the bulletin. And we'll have a quick look at a couple of the bulletins in a moment. So that's sort of just general information, what to look at, out for, what to consider with, um, <coughs> what's going on. 
So here's just a screenshot of part of an Austrian uh, bulletin. I quite like the Austrian and Spanish bulletins. They're really clear. They've got lots of, lots of pictures. I either have got the graphics at the top, um, the rows, uh, that north-south. So in this one, they're concerned about a persistent weak layer at all aspects, but in particular, on all aspects of the mountain, but in particular between 1600 and 2600. Um, below 2400 meters on all aspects, they're worried about uh, gliding snow. So that was in February 2009. I can't remember if it was particularly warm then. And then you've got some dialogue of what, what's going on. So have a look at these. You can Google them, easy to find. Uh, won't help if we go the right way. The Spanish ones, the Spanish have pretty much completely adopted the American system. And having trained in North America on my avalanche stuff, I like it because I look at it and go, ah, it's great. And it gives you slightly different, uh, of slightly more detailed information, more information of the state of snow at different elevations. They break down the elevation risk in more detail and the probability. It's more graphical. But have a look. Uh, the Italian ones are quite cool, the Aosta, the French um, is fairly simplistic, but it gives you the right information. Google Translate does a reasonable job to give you the right gist as well of the, uh, the different, different bulletins. So that's the kind of thing to consider before you actually get out there. Kit, um, I'm always asked, oh, what do you carry in your rucksack? Um, everything, the first and foremost, everything in there pretty much has at least two uses. And this is something that I carry in resort or backcountry. Doesn't matter, whenever I'm skiing off-piste, I spend probably 90% of my season skiing off-piste and backcountry. So uh, a piece of groomers are something uh, are there, they're great access to um, what I find more exciting and more enjoyable stuff. But um, skis, boots, binding skins, there's loads of them. Uh, loads of different. I use G3. I really like G3. It's designed specifically for backcountry. Um, and I use a thing called a pin binding. You can get ones that a lot of the uh, modern alpine boots have a warp mode, and you can get adapters for alpine bindings that clip in like a, a ski boot that allow you to free your heel, stuff like that. Um, ski crampons for the spring when it's really icy i always carry those because it's sods all the time you need them is the time you've left them at home three things that i believe um people regardless of where they're skiing whether it's on piece off piece backcountry should be trained on and should carry last season or the last few seasons we've had a number of instances where avalanches have come down over blue runs in resort there have been multiple burials um, there have been fatalities there have even been instructors turning up not knowing how to use some of the avalanche safety kit because there is this there's this perception and responsibility to and they do the skiers do everything they can to make everything safe but carrying and knowing how to use a probe a transceiver and a shovel i i would love to see more widely used and understood. Um, more and more organizations, the Chamonix and Ard in, in Chamonix offer free training courses. I offer a number of days for free at the beginning of the season for locals. It's so important that when you're buying these, get really robust ones. Uh, not the mega lightweight carbon schemo ones. They're frankly crap. They bend, they snap. And if you come on one of my courses, you've got one of them, you might end up snapping it when you have a go um one of my mentors and trainers is known to bend shovels and snap probes to demonstrate it they are useless um the other kit in there it's all fairly standard stuff if you're going out to buy kit and a rucksack around about 25 liters and a lot of them have a separate uh compartment for your safety gear what i mean by that is shovel probe and transceiver I call it a wet room, so skins, anything that wet is wet, it goes in there because it's separate from everything else. Um, first aid, basic repair. My first aid kit is that size uh, for 
even multiple day back country. Um, I'm an emergency medical technician as well. We can talk about that later if you want. Repair kit basically comprises of, these are just ski straps. They're the long ski straps. You can fix humans and bindings, boots, skins with these. That's all you need and a Leatherman or a multi-tool for screws if you've got that. That's, it doesn't need to be big and onerous, these massive packs. And then really what, what you like. Um, always take something warm, an extra jacket, an extra pair of gloves, extra hat. Um, the variants of whether you all know from resort. Any of you were, that were in Bakira last year in Spain, there was one or two days where it clagged out and I remember skiing down when I was, I had a group of eight or seven or eight uh, sort of young kids and look back and there's a line of 50 of people who just crapped out really, really quickly. Um, so various bits and pieces around that. I'm not gonna go into too much detail around, around that kit, but that's a, a list. And I can make this, these slides available so you've got a, a look at that. Um, and really, finally, just six things to really consider. And this is whether you're nipping off the edge of a piece and you're in something that is the high 20 degrees. So you're talking about into 30 degrees. You're talking about red run terrain, broadly some blue run terrain, but broadly red run terrain and above, but it's off piste. Um, safe locations. Those of you that do ski off piste, you'll already know this. You're skiing down, you get to what you think is safe. The likelihood is it's not, because our perception of diff distance and how far avalanches can travel and where they travel can be a bit skewed. So rule of thumb, really easy. If you identify a safe piece of terrain, just imagine pouring um, some uh, red cordial, red water down the slope from where the terrain, where the full line or the line of gravity is gonna take that and then the distance from away and double it. Really, really simple to do, to imagine that. Group size, um, never more than five people. And the reason for that is about communication and having a communication plan, how you can see each other, make sure you can see each other pretty much at all times. Never stop in or below avalanche paths, pretty obvious, but you'd be amazed. Um, I ski around, uh, um, it was uh, Courcheval and people stood at the bottom of the gullies and I'm like, what? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, a tricky one is really descending above uh, another group or other, more to the point other groups descending above you. You're, it's kind of out of your control, but uh, that spatial awareness, situational awareness around you. Avoid traps, even rollovers can be terrain traps where they, the, the slope comes over and the, the con, convexity in the slope at the bottom of these where it uh, evens out a little bit in the bottom there. Even something as little as five or eight meters, that can bury you pretty deep. It's where all the snow is going to collect. Um, gullies, obviously, cliffs, trees, all those sorts of things. If there is any doubt whatsoever, and in fact, what is really good practice is what they say is ski out one at a time. If you know you're in avalanche terrain, but it's a level two day and you're having a ball of a day, unless it's absolutely necessary to ski multiple people at a time down a slope, ski one at a time. Um, that means that there's only ever any chance of one person ever getting uh, buried. That means there's two, three, up to four people available to, uh, to dig you out should you need it. With that, if you are skiing off piece regularly, frankly, the Avalanche transceiver parks are great at learning the really easy bit. The transceiver bit is the easy bit. In fact, in the UK, you've all got tons of snow. Go out, get your shovel if you've got one, find some snow plow debris, start sticking your probe into that and digging that. That is the closest thing you're gonna to get to avalanche debris, and it's brutal. So go and have a play. Um, Oh, and that's pretty much me. We've got, um, I think my screen is just conked out. Can people still see my screen? Yeah. It's gone blank. Yeah, mate. Yeah. 
so that's us really um just before any questions if anyone's got any or wants to chat um the next session uh is i'm still defining but we've got a case study that is in from valdez air some of you might know the person um that's with with their permission but some more a deeper dive into resourcing planning and then the sort of 101 about terrain management and risk and the actual principles of rescue um, if you want to get really geeky avalanche canada um, in the and then avalanche new zealand have some great free resources like chunk down up to 12 15 hours really getting into some geeky stuff so if you're missing the snow and want to see some spectacular stuff and learn at the same time, get onto their free e-learning courses. They are fabulous. Anyone got any questions? Someone's asked about what your view on airbags is and when to wear one, Ian. Um, I think they're great. Um, they're not guaranteed. The reason why they work is that uh, they just make you bigger. It's simple as that. Um, the the big stuff, the bigger lumps get shaken to the surface of um, airbags. They're great in most of the avalanches that uh, you'll probably come across. They're pointless in the spring in wet snow avalanches. Um, I have never worn one, though this season I have been toying about uh, getting one. Um, interestingly, a guide friend of I were skiing and an avalanche airbag bag saved our life without even deploying it. We were skiing over in the back country behind uh, La Tuile and all in between La Tuile and Cormier. <clears throat> this guide friend of mine, we'd been skiing, it was about lunchtime, early afternoon, <clears throat> and he hadn't got his release handle out from the, its pouch, which you have to do to make it accessible. And we're quite happy. We do a lot of work together, um, both pretty competent. Um, and we're at the top of this uh, coal. And we're going, we're going to have a look and see if we want to ski this particular run. Subconsciously, he undid his uh, release. And we were like, hmm, oh, yeah, pretty happy for that. And when I noticed that, I turned to him and said, why did you just do that? He goes, what? Undo your release. And uh, he said, oh, I don't know. I said, on that basis, I don't know what it is, but let's just go the other way. Half an hour later, looking back, that slope had slid. So there's something that he picked up. <laughs> uh, but they are, I, I like them. I think the concept are, but it's, you've got to practice with them. And you've got to make it accessible to use. Are they one time only? Uh, are they one time only? Some are, some aren't. They're easily refilled in most resorts. Uh, some are compressed gas, uh, some are powered by an electric fan. Um, there's some really good research on them. I think it's either Gear Junkie and there's, uh, there's another US website that are the, the Gear Geeks. Some really cool reviews on a lot of the airbags in the last 18, 24 months. So there's some, the Black Diamond one seems to consistently come up out high up there but all box mammoths most of the guys i know that ski with an airbag ski with mammoths so there's some fell, some good out there if you sorry say again fell, if you fell with it would if you fell over would it um inflate or not no you have to deploy it oh, there's a handle know. that you have to like a like a parachute Oh, right. Oh, so you have to, oh, okay. You have to pull it yeah, it's not like an airbag in a car. Yeah, it's not, it's not like I a, thought it was not, impact. No, it's not like a <laughs> no. I thought the snow hits you and that's it. No. no. Oh, okay. Right, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> Fast. Well, you would know. I'm just gonna, <laughs> I'm just gonna quickly jump in, guys. If, if the Zoom does happen to go off, which is looking like it might do in, two and a half minutes time just click straight back on again and we'll we'll continue on but um if you keep going for the next two and a half minutes in if anyone's got any more questions for you uh, but if it does click off just jump straight back on again okay okay anyone any questions for ian or do you want to put something in the chat you can do feel free
Well, that was very interesting. Actually, Joe, Joe, who's sat in Jack's, and I know the ice cream store, they fill out, they get their airbags refilled in the ice cream shop. <laughs> I'd rather have the ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> so not all of them, but most of, most of the compressed air ones, it's just CO2. So in Chamonix, the bike shops can refill them. Um, some of them require a valve to replace, but are just a little rubber valve, things like that. It's, yeah. it, it should, it's getting increasingly easy to, to get them refilled. Because they're quite expensive, aren't they? How much are they? Do you know? Oh, wow. Well, they, they start, I think, at around five... five 550 I euros. Stone Rock and we start them at 650 and they go yeah. up to over a thousand. Yeah, there you go. I've got a discount. Price good. <laughs> so Karen, you say there's one electric ones with fans. You're absolutely right. And I can't remember the manufacturer. Some of the fan ones are, you've got to be careful. Some are quite relatively slow. And we're talking seconds here. Um, that there's a, a debate around the fan filled ones. The principle is great because they fill the entire airbag and I'm testing my physics knowledge here. I can't, I think it's the Venturi effect that some of the gas ones work on where they, the gas canister only uh, explodes two thirds of the required volume into the bag. But by doing that, Air, other air sucked in, it's something like that. So that's where a bit of research, um, David uh, Dawson's nodding. Um, <laughs> there's something around that. So that research, but some of the fan ones I know have um, been known not to fully inflate fast enough. That might be old information. So research, research, research on that, what is a vital piece of kit that you hopefully never have to use. Can I, can I just say the Artrix one, which I'm sure is bound to be one of the most, if not the most expensive one. Stuffs around uh, probes and shovels and uh, planning, stuff like that, but it's there. Feel free to uh, go and have a look or I'll, I'll make sure they're available to Ali and he can circulate them. Um, did, did, did we finish off David Dawson's question? I don't know if he got Time to it, 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 Ali, it, it wasn't so much a question. I was just going to say that one of the things that the Arctic guys said, it said was a major advantage with their system because it's electric fan operated was the fact that you get multiple hits in a day because okay, they were yeah. saying that it's really important to practice, practice with these things. And so the electric ones do have that advantage. You've got m multiple uses in a, in a day. Um, thing, and uh, the, the yeah, the cylinder gas ones are one shot. I'm glad you said yeah, that for practice purposes, because if you find yourself getting caught in more than one avalanche in a day, you really should rethink things. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I'm with you, Mark. And uh, yeah, it just shows a couple of mates, uh, uh, Arthrix ambassadors, um, and I know how they ski. <laughs> 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 Maybe that's why why they've designed it that way, but. Um, Certainly, uh, avalanche victims, uh, the last thing they're probably thinking about doing, the ones that have been fully buried, is going out for another ski that day. <laughs> Maybe, but it is, I think you're right. There is that in terms of practice and deployment and getting used to it. That's a, is a great feature, a fantastic feature, because I, I know people that use them and I've asked you, have you ever actually deployed it? No, 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 no because it's going to cost me to refill. I said, man, it's going to cost you 15 bucks. Come on. Um, but uh, there is that psychological practice. Um, Karen, basic yeah. transceivers. Uh, Joe, you're, you're my man. BCA trackers. Love them. They are BCA, and uh, which is backcountry access, American brand. Um, they set themselves up to make great transceivers. Uh, all transceivers these days are pretty damn good. There's been some noise around the peeps and the black diamond on off switch, uh, turning itself off, these sorts of things. There's nuances to them all. The best transceiver is the one that you know how to use. Um, they all have quirks. 
in my on my courses I have Ortvox, Peeps, a really old Ortvox, Black Diamond and uh, BCA and different versions and they all kind of do things differently. Mammut make great ones um, but as a specific I think the the best one I've seen in simplicity, accuracy, robustness, robustness is the BCA Tracker 2. Um, price wise it's a pretty good price point I think it's just so shy of 300 euros who's our snow and rock man he might know some prices but you're, you're spending about give or take 300 pounds on a transceiver but learn how to use it what um what what we'll do guys is if you've got any more questions for <laughs> Ian or any specific questions uh, again place them into the chat um and we can um we can then pass them on to Ian um, or you can email or send us a, a message on WhatsApp or yep. um, Messenger, and we, we can just collate a load of the questions that you're asking, so then Ian can uh, prepare for the next session when he does it, and um, he can give give some answers to it then. So um, if everyone's happy with that, just place it in the chat or email us or send us a message, and we um, we can, we can then get Ian to start expanding how, with regards to your questions, he can develop the the sessions that he's going to do. So um, I'm sure. He's happy to do that, Ian, yeah? Yep, perfect. Thanks, folks. Pleasure. Thank, <laughs> thank you very much, um, Ian, for that. Excellent stuff. Um, to I'm just going to show you the progressional video that we have within IAZ and just talk you through a few points and highlight a, a few key aspects that we do look at as we start to go through the progression. Posture and balance being one of the crucial elements that we will always look for. And simply to have good posture means that the upper body, the hips are stable over the feet at all times. When we want to create a rounded turn, we need to progressively move our joints, our ankles, knees, and our hip to be able to apply pressure through the beginning of the turn but this is more for the learner phase about where our balance should be rather than too much on the focus of pressure control. The main emphasis will be through the end of the turn where we're resisting and that is where the flexing comes in and we are resisting force, gravity, which pulls us down the hill and you will start to notice that the ankles and knees will flex and bend more towards the end phase of the turn. So if we look at Jamie just here, we can see there's some flexing now starting to happen from a good upper body stable position. And he is now starting to resist and manage through the end phase of the turn. If we now go to the next part, you can see Jamie's leg is much taller, straighter. That is where he's starting to apply his balance and an amount of pressure to the outside ski. Starting to press that ski into the ground to create a stable platform so that he can make a smooth transition from one foot to the other. He's now about to stand on his right leg, steer the right leg through the corner, and you can see now he is flexing to absorb and manage the forces during the end of the turn. Upper body, again, is stable, hands forward, usual, usual points that we look for, but the hip joint here is directly over the middle of the foot. This creates a stable platform in preparation for the beginning of the next turn which will happen quite shortly. This phase here again now, he's starting to stretch, starting to press against the outside ski, but most crucially, it's gaining his balance on his outside steering foot, the left ski. And you can see as he comes around the corner, this leg is starting to form some resistance through using a small amount of edge. He's starting to create a little bit of separation with the upper body stable and balanced but the legs leaning in towards the slope itself this creates the position where he can stay and maintain balance with this part of the body over this side of the ski and not falling this way into the turn as he comes through the end phase again he flexes bends gets the control manages the force and then gets him prepared and ready for the next turn which you can see again he starts to stretch and press. This is all happening <clears throat> slowly at the beginning of the next turn. But we have a full movement and shift of balance around the full line 
And then once he comes through the fall line, as he goes into that parallel position, he is now fully in control of the outside ski and both skis working together. <clears throat> as this starts to develop, the speed and turn shape will begin to change. As we start to go faster, we need to apply more forces at the beginning of the turn so that we start to make a more active stretch against the new outside ski. And there will also need to be a bit more flexion through the end phase of the turn. You can see that the movements, as they become confident and comfortable with them, will become closer to the full line, which will allow the skis to start working more together. But crucially, once this does, we would like to then see the transition of the movements across the skis happening that little bit earlier. If the upper body posture is stable and in place, we can start to create what we talk about angulation, separation, with the legs leaning one way, but not allowing the body to fall into the turn. As we get onto the parallel stage, the speed will start to increase. You will notice that we'll start to go slightly faster, <clears throat> but crucially, the turn shape is rounded. If we go back to the Z-shaped turns versus the rounded turns, the Z-shape will be a quick transition of the feet moving from one direction to the other, which means the body has to try and catch up with what the feet are doing. For an intermediate, lower level beginner, they can't move these two separate things at once. So we need to take time in transitioning from one turn to the other. And this is where a rounded turn shape will help us. It gives us time to stretch and bend and to be able to steer the skis around the corner. Same position as you finish in a snowplow turn or a plow parallel turn, but the movement is quicker, so we're balanced over the outside ski, so we can initiate the inside ski turning at the very same time. The tilt angle of the skis, okay, will be happening together. The leg lean, will start to control more of the grip, so there is more resistance through the end of the turn. One of the common things that we see happen in lower level skiers is that they'll tend to move backwards or they'll tend to move inside towards the slope itself. And this is just a nervousness, apprehensive of where the skis are gonna to start to take them, but not committing that balance and posture to the outside ski early enough to help the transition of the plow parallel or basic parallel turn. The balance needs to happen early, but the timing is crucial. We still stretch to press against the outside ski, but now we're starting to bring into this phase, the parallel turn, the legs tilting and leaning at the same time, but not allowing the body to fall into the turn. Once we reach here, the full line, you can already see the increased edge angulation, the separation, legs leaning one way, body not so much the other. And so as we come to the steered action through the end where we're managing the force, this allows us to stay stable so the skis do not judder around, wobble about, or cannot grip and steer at the end phase of the turn. This is where we want to make sure that we stretch early enough there and we want to flex early enough as well but you'll notice on the turns these are still rounded which still gives us time to get the posture and the movements correct if we rush the movements the skis won't be in the right position in the turn to be able to maintain our posture and position so we end up rushing with the upper body movement inside or back so the skis then suddenly get pushed out sideways, which creates the Z-shaped turn. And this is not what we're looking to achieve. Matching the movements with the turn shape is crucial. And I'm sure it's something a lot of people have been told before. If we then take it out of the beginner progression and now move into short radius and even into long radius turns, the movements become quicker. They become sharper and they actually start to become more efficient and effective by using the legs more so underneath the body without the body having to move too much at all. The more we bring the body into this phase of the turn, 
the more Z-shaped or skidded the turns will be. We want to now increase the edge angle, but this will only happen if the movements are accurately timed. So from the beginning to the end of the turn, and we start to use the legs in the steered action, tilting to gain edge grip, rotation to get a change of direction, and also managing the force and the pressure through the beginning and the end of the turn. These all need to happen with the legs working now separately to where the body will work. So you can see here, the body is maintained facing down the full line. The skis and the legs are being worked. The turn shape, most crucially, is rounded because that is us allowing us time to make the movements with the legs to manage the steering application throughout from beginning to end. Again, look at the short turn, rounded, which means it's being steered. You can see edge grip through the end of phase of the turn. Here, we have to transition. The skis become flat to allow some rotation to happen and then increase the edge angle to get the grip. The movements are happening from a stable upper body posture and allowing the legs to work below the body. Maintaining the upper body, head, shoulders in the full line is crucial to allow the steering action to happen. And you can see the rounded turn shape that the guys are making here. It allows the skis time to transition from one turn to the next. This is a crucial part that we have to have happen. If the timing of the turn becomes too quick, we rush our movements, our body, our posture, too soon in one phase or the other, the turn won't become rounded and steered. Again, if we move the legs separately to the body, in an awkward way, i.e. push and shove them to the side, the body ends up being thrown into the turn because the skis have not matched what the body is trying to achieve. There's a mixture of different ways to perform short turns. The long turns itself follows the same simple process that we talked about from the beginning. The rounded turn shape as you can see with the tracks here that Jordan's leaving okay he's timing his movements again so that as he comes from one transition to the other he's not rushing his body or his legs from one direction to the other as you can see the appropriate range and rate of movement has just been highlighted here and that is essential to making sure that we can create angulation balance stability through each phase of the turn and you can see that there's a slight stretch and bend still happening in the long term to make it more efficient and effective from one side to the other. I'm just going to show some simple um, bumps here. But again, if you take this as a short turn, look at how the body is staying in the full line. The movements from the legs, they're not rushed, they're not quick. He's giving himself time to adjust to get the ski steered accurately around the corner. OK, a couple of simple exercises here that we have braquage. Again, taking their time to get the movement pattern right. Movements under control allow us to be able to use the steering skills and the skis themselves effectively and efficiently. We always want to maintain a good upper body posture in whatever we're trying to achieve to allow the legs efficiently to steer below the body. Crucial part of all of this is timing. If we get the timing right and don't rush the turns, we will achieve our outcome. Making sure that you sometimes slow the speed down will be a crucial part to what we're trying to achieve. So this is why we sometimes go backwards in the progression with skiers to give them time to slow down their movements, to feel accurately what's going on inside their skis, uh, inside their boots, sorry, and also to make sure that they can feel what the skis are doing underneath their body so they feel stable control at all times.
and uh, sorry about the disturbances through the through the video there but hopefully you got a bit of a, an idea um, of where we was coming from there um, does does that make sense to everyone did you get a bit of an idea of where I was coming from with the, the movements and um, the, the rounded the rounded turn shape is, is something that I will particularly look at when I'm, I'm teaching and coaching people and uh, to make sure that we do get this element of control there, there might be certain points when we, we might want to use a, a more Z-shaped turn, but it's, it's very infrequent. It is more usually the rounded shape that we are looking for, but that will come down to how the movements are worked and used effectively during all types of turns. And especially if you look from the beginner progression up, if you get the beginner progression being done correctly, as, I, as I've said before, you will tend to find that those movement patterns and the timing that is so crucial to helping the balance will be in your own personal skiing as well, whether it be uh, short turns, long turns, skiing in the bumps, skiing in off, off piste, uh, variable snow, etc. Uh, and that is why I, I particularly, when I do coach people, I take people back to the, the slower maneuvers sometimes to really enhance the, the movements and the posture, the balance working within the slower speed because sometimes it's actually more difficult to do at a slower speed because balance is so crucial at the lower end of the spectrum, okay? As soon as we add speed into our skiing, sometimes that masks the problems that are already there. But also, if we are skiing faster, we tend to be focusing more on just the outcome of trying to control that speed rather than focusing on the input of our performance, which is the movements, posture, balance, all working hand in hand, okay? Does anyone have any questions at all that you'd like to put to me? No? Brilliant. Excellent. Bring on the snow. <laughs> Bring on yeah, the snow. No. Open Hemel. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll, I'll try my best. I'll try my best. The mountain. <laughs> yeah. Can you upgrade your internet for next time, Ali, so the video plays a bit smoother? <laughs> I just, I just had a comment from someone that it was smooth, so I'm taking that as a positive rather than negative. But um, yeah, I don't know if that was me letting someone into the chat or whether that was the internet or, or just the user. I'll put it down to the user error. So um, <laughs> the user was on Windows 95. <laughs> <laughs> Still errors. Yeah, possibly. Still works. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if um, from a, an instructional point of view, if Ian or Mark want to add anything to what I've just sort of shown there on the. On, on my little presentation, if there's anything else they think they would use from their perspective, or if anyone else would like to add anything in, feel free to, to join in as well. Ali, can I ask? Yep. It's Patrick here in Dublin. Hi, um, I, I, I see, uh, I see IAZ is adding switch skiing to level two, which I think it's overdue. Can you show us some videos on the standard for that, and maybe in a future session? Yeah, I, I, I can do. Um, I know that the guys that are able to be on a mountain and uh, are able to put the lovely new IAZ uniform on have already started doing some new videos, uh, which should hopefully be released by the middle of the summer. Um, but I believe they've, they've already got some footage of the uh, level one, two, three, and four uh, or switch riding. Um, so we can, we can definitely get hold of that at some point. And um, yeah, we can, we can run through the, um, uh, the sort of simple guidelines that we're looking for for Great. level one through to level four so not a problem at all patrick and uh, and do they also require 360 turns not not to my knowledge from the last uh communication i had with the head of education i, I don't believe it's going to be a 360 required that might be placed in there as an additional tool or as a a, a new exercise to be used around that that upper level it wouldn't be brought into, I, I doubt very much it'd be brought into the lower levels. That would be more specific to level three, level four, I would imagine. But again, I, I can get clarification on that. But just as a, as a basic outline of what we're looking for with switch riding, it will be simple snowplow turns for a level one. It is plow parallel for a level two. It is parallel for a level three and carve switch riding for level four. Right just, here. Thank you. Just, uh, just as a side note here, because it will kind of lead into what I'm going to wrap things up with today. Um, it, it, it's worth kind of mentioning that the the tools that we use to assess on on courses, and some of those tools are 
a carve turn, advanced parallel, intermediate parallel, uh, switch skiing, they're used to assess your skill level, uh, as it were. So you, the aim should, and I think this, is, this should sound fairly obvious, but obviously the aim is to, de to develop your skills to a point where you can achieve those outcomes of a round turn shape, you know, early edge grip, early pressure and things like that within this turn shape on this terrain. And that's kind of how you differentiate between between the skill levels, as opposed to necessarily getting out there and saying, well, I, I need to go and uh, let's say a 360 spin on the snow was uh, was part of a, a level two or level three or something like that. And you could say, well, I need to get out there and practice um, that 360 on snow. Well, yeah, I mean, to a certain extent you do, but you also need to have the skill set in place to be able to go and do that as well. Um, you know, and it's the same thing if you were practicing those 360s and unsuccessful, well, why am I unsuccessful? What do I need to go away and develop in order to allow me to do that? So always, always kind of keep the, the mindset on developing skills as opposed to performing maneuvers, uh, just, just in case there's any kind of confusion there, but that, that might become a bit clearer as, a, as I kind of wrap things up in a, in a little bit. What um what we'll, what we'll do is Mark, if you go through this this um this last section now, um we've got about nine minutes or so left um on the Zoom, so just give you a bit of a warning. Um, so yeah, we'll, get through that kind of time. Yeah, we'll we'll go through the we'll go through the last little bit. If there's anything, I can see there's some stuff being placed into the chat. Again, if there's any questions you you'd like to pose us, um just stick it into the chat. Or again, you can email us or um, send it through on WhatsApp or Messenger. But yeah, I'll get Mark to go through the last bit, just in case it does cut off before Mark. I'll, I'll I'll give a little wave now, but um, yeah, you've got about nine minutes, Mark. So if you can sort of get it yeah. into about seven and a half, on, eight minutes. Can you put on screen sharing again, please? Oh, I certainly can. And I apologise in advance because we are going to get cut off because I'm doing a terrible job of of not waffling on uh, these days at the moment. It is very much something I want to improve upon, but um, I recognise my fault right now that I waffle on quite a bit, well beyond. Uh, get on with it. Why would? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Waffle. Sorry. Oh God. Okay. Yes, shameless, uh, shameless pictures and stuff. So um, I wanted to, obviously lots of people were asking about um, information about courses like level two intro, um, level three teaching advice, level three information, uh, level two information, all of this kind of stuff. And, and the more I kept thinking about how I wanted to start this conversation, the more it, it, it kept coming back to the things that we discussed last week. So I've, I've titled this one, Learning Versus Performance 2. Um, um, but with, really with a, with a look at how we're obtaining higher certifications. So this kind of, I, I want to simplify it. And just because I, I simplify how we might think about it doesn't mean I'm, I'm saying it's easy because we know this isn't. But each certification is a skill-based assessment of your performance along your learning journey. What I mean by that, if you take kind of your skill level being here at zero and a linear progression to get to here as either the best skiing that you can possibly achieve or, or the best skiing that is possible to achieve, the Michaela Schifrins of the world, the Marcel Hirsch's of the world, as, as, as examples, you know, Johnny Mosley's for bump skiers, whatever kind of thing you want to describe as the best skill-based skiing, a level one slots in here, a level two slots in here, three slots in here, four, level four slots in there, but they're still up here as well, okay? Each each certification is just assessing your skill level at that point in time. And it does it really by, for the most part, assessing your performance, i.e. using various turn sizes, speeds and terrain to see what your skill level is currently at. Um, obviously the secondary nature of a course is to also help you develop your skills to achieve some of these things. Um, but to also set you up for success so that you can perform to your best. You can put your skills on the best showcase possible. Um, so with that in mind, Ali's kind of mentioned some of this already in his. These are some of the things we look at when we're assessing. And some of these things stay the same. Well, they all kind of stay the same pretty much all the way throughout. So, you know, the round, a rounded turn shape. You know, that obviously shows a smooth blending of, of certain steering skills, rhythm. Uh, for me, that's, you know, does the turn link smoothly like this or is it disjointed is there a, a gap in the middle where it's just one turn and the next turn as opposed to smoothly linked turns 
um, control of speed and direction. You know, for any any anyone spent some time teaching, we kind of hammer that in from day one when we teach someone to make a snowplow stop, if that's how we choose to to teach them to stop. But we we choose to teach them to stop like that because on how we develop the skills progressively, not because we're teaching them to make a snowplow. Okay, the goal is to not the goal is to ski parallel. The goal is 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 up here somewhere, not not to make a snowplow. Uh, connection with the ground most evident in situations like bumps where we're trying to keep our skis on the ground and not get bounced all over the place. Um, the alternative to that might be skiing powder where we actually do want to try and bounce up and out of the powder. We need to control our connection with the ground. Um, and that's applied to a variety of situations. So if we put that in relation to level one through to level four, for example, uh, let's say you take what we call an intermediate parallel turn. It's, just, it's basically a middle sized turn uh, at a slow to middle speed okay within within that turn it always needs to we always want it to be round we always want it to have a consistent speed and rhythm to it uh, things like this but as we go from level one through to four well on level one it's we hoping you can do that inside a snow dome or on an artificial slope or on a very easy slope on a mountain uh, at level two this now needs to happen on a mountain on slightly steeper terrain in potentially not ideal conditions. If, it's, if there's been 10 centimeters of fresh snow the day before, well now we're skiing through chop during the day and we, that's something we have to deal with. Um, it's still intermediate parallel. Um, if we then take it to level three, uh, once again, steeper terrain, uh, able to make adjustments to how we apply those skills and, and apply that grip and balance and pressure early on to control our speed throughout the entire turn shape because we're on steeper terrain. Um, the level four CSIA has an intermediate parallel on expert terrain, which seems a bit bizarre. And, and honestly, I, I sometimes struggle to justify it in my, in my head myself as to why we do that. But when you think of when I'm taking a student onto that kind of terrain for the first time, while that intermediate parallel turn might well be the turn size and speed that I go to to get down that for the first time before we start trying you know shorter turns um, by the same token I, I might want to try a shorter term so the actual outcomes the things that we're looking at don't necessarily change but your ability to perform them increases because your skill level has increased uh, throughout that process and so really what this kind of takes me towards is is maybe we need to consider how we learn, how we train and, and how we practice. Like what are we actually going to do when we get on snow as opposed to breaking down an intermediate parallel turn that can be every bit as useful, but we just kind of need to have a little bit of think about how we're going to go through this because um, the teaching is very much a similar thing. You know, that stuff that if for any of you that have done the courses, you know, the basic <laughs> principles, the, the skill acquisition model, uh, the skills model, these, these things don't change from level one to four, you just need to get better at them. Uh, and I know that's a really overly simplified thing to say, but that is, that is skill development. We, we need to get better at them through practice, through deliberate practice uh, and the appropriate focus. Um, and I'm not saying that, that that's easy. Um, Please don't, please don't kind of confuse me simplifying what we're actually trying to do with me saying that it's easy because it does take a lot of time. It does take a lot of practice and it, and it will, be, will be challenging. But what I kind of encourage you guys to do is the thought that I've, that's gone through my head is it's kind of like if you go into the gym and you see a personal trainer or, or someone in there and you're like, well, I want to lose some weight. Well, the first thing they're going to do is say, OK, well, how much weight do you want to lose or how much weight do we need to lose you know, by doing measurements and stuff like that, potentially? what time frame do you have for it? If you've, if you've got like a beach holiday coming up or you're attending a wedding and you need to fit into a dress, whatever it might be, why, like, you, you start to get a little bit more specific is what I'm getting at there. And what I'd like to do is for you guys, when you're giving us suggestions of things you'd like to cover, rather than that general level three intro, in, intro or the level, level two information, maybe a little bit more specific on, on areas and that you would like to see covered or things that you're kind of confused about so that we can kind of um, go there. Uh, and whether that's sending messages to Ali, myself, uh, we might, it might be worth us trying to come up with uh, something that you guys can all post your, your, your feedback and your thoughts and ideas to. But that's really where I wanted to start this from was 
trying to get a little bit more specific on what you guys want to see out of looking at course specific information. That's it for me. I made it nine minutes. Boom. Brilliant. Well done. We've, we've got literally, we've got literally about 60 seconds, I think left um, uh, on this. So as Mark said, if you want to send us an email or drop some uh, info into the chat, then feel free to put some information in there and um, tell us a little bit more about what's going on. I'll, I'll get it all sorted for next week so we can stay on for hours and hours and hours and hours chatting and listening to lovely Mark and Ian. We'd have to leave at three. <laughs> <laughs> But just thank before, you guys. Thank you. Excellent. before thank it runs out, thanks everyone. Thank you guys. Yeah, thank you everyone for attending, especially uh, Joe with the very early start over there yeah. and uh, Don Lillico over in uh, Canada as well. Thanks for joining us, Don. I know yeah, it's an early start for you as well. Thanks, Mark. It was very well done. Thanks, Don. Thank you very much, everyone. And, uh, stay safe, take care, and we'll thank see you next week. All the best. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks.